Hi, everyone. Welcome to our channel. Douglas McGregor has remarked, the definition of a full-scale ground invasion is uncertain. It's challenging to gauge. Reports suggest they are considering deploying 10,000 troops, presumably extensively trained to enter northern Gaza. Such actions could likely incite a significant response from the Muslim world. It's anticipated that nations spanning from Indonesia to Morocco will react strongly. He expresses deep concerns suggesting a unified military coalition may form against Israel and the region. He particularly highlights Turkey's potential involvement surpassing his previous concerns about Iran. Regarding recent mediation efforts, he initially welcomed them, but now sees them as a prelude to potential Turkish military intervention, cautioning against the consequences. He doubts the efficacy of naval power in deterring regional conflicts, emphasizing the risk of a broader war. He underscores Turkey's substantial military capabilities and warns of potential alignment of Turkey and Iran, posing a grave threat to Israel's security. He advocates for intervention to prevent what he sees as a dangerous trajectory under Mr. Netanyahu's leadership. On the issue of targeting Hamas, he acknowledges Israel's legitimate concerns but emphasizes the complexity of the problem. He recently shifted his stance, portraying them as holy warriors defending their territory. This alignment with Israel's opponents raises concerns. It takes a decisive to oppose Israel's plans to enter Gaza. Similar precedents exist, like Richard Nixon's stance against Israeli presence on the Egyptian side of the Suez Canal, which led to positive outcomes. There's apprehension about jeopardizing existing relations, especially considering Egypt's efforts to cooperate with Israel and its warning of the Hamas attack. The challenge lies in quelling the populace's anger across the Muslim world, notably in Egypt, under General Saisai's leadership. Elective punishment undermines Israeli security. Regarding potential conflict escalation with Iran, prominent figures like Lindsey Graham and Norman Peretz advocate for aggressive actions. The current climate suggests a growing push for confrontation with targeted strikes, likely leading to full-scale war. Of course, this is an ongoing issue. It's not new. These individuals have repeatedly expressed their desire for years. They believe they now have an administration they can influence, one they can coerce into action. They don't even need to coerce. There are plenty of individuals within of the Biden cabinet who are firmly committed to attacking Iran. This fixation on attacking Iran distracts from other significant events in the region, as we've discussed. Attacking Iran while a quarter of a million Turkish troops move through Syria to confront Israel on the Golan Heights is a scenario few are considering. What happens when Turkish forces at sea engage air forces at sea? Currently, our forces aren't moving into the eastern Mediterranean due to the risk of attack from various weapon systems. So for now, the safest place carrier battle group is somewhere near Sicily. However, that's a considerable distance for jets carrying ordnance to reach targets like Hezbollah. Everything revolves around Hezbollah. If Israel decisively strikes into Gaza, it's anticipated to trigger a two-front war with Hezbollah launching its arsenal of missiles and rockets into Israel, this would involve other actors like Syria, Turkey, Iran, and Russia. Russia wouldn't sit by as Iran is destroyed. And while they don't seek war with Israel, they may feel compelled to support Iran. This situation reminds me of 1914, when various actors in Europe decided to go to war without any real reason for Britain to get involved. Similarly, nobody considered that having the most powerful fleet wouldn't stop a million German troops from advancing into France. In addition to the American soldiers who are already stationed there, there are about 1,000 in Syria and likely a similar number in Iraq. Additionally, there are American bases in Turkey where nuclear weapons are stored. This issue was raised during the final months of the Trump administration operation, and I advocated for their removal due to uncertainty about the future. However, Erdogan's leadership in Turkey poses a unique challenge. What should we do about our bases? As in Cyrillic and others, we have personnel on the ground, including soldiers, airmen, and sailors. Could they become hostages? Would the Turks take control of these bases? These questions pose a larger problem than the current hostage situation in Gaza. There are no apparent benefits for the United States in this situation. Instead, we risk being drawn into something for which we are unprepared. Regarding special operations forces, it's not surprising that we have them deployed. There was an unfortunate incident where American special op soldiers were celebrated in Israel, prompting concerns about their safety. While there are various estimates of their numbers, their involvement is undeniable. As for the potential for intervention, additional capabilities are being deployed to the region, including Patriot missiles and high-altitude air defense systems to counter the Iranian missile threat. Once these assets are in place, it's likely that the plan is to send troops into Gaza. 
He addresses the second question first, discussing the complexity of the environment and the challenges soldiers face in distinguishing enemies from civilians. He highlights the dangers present in conflict zones and the necessity for soldiers to prioritize survival. Regarding immigration, he suggests that the lack of tracking and oversight poses significant risks, as demonstrated by the 9-11S attackers who entered legally but overstayed their visas. He warns of potential threats from groups like Hezbollah and Hamas, particularly their presence in Mexico and the potential for attacks within the United States. He reflects on the historical efforts of Israeli soldiers to avoid civilian casualties, but acknowledges the possibility of mistakes, cite incidents such as the accidental bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade during the Kosovo air campaign. He expresses concern about potential future attacks on American soil by individuals affiliated with such groups, emphasizing the need for vigilance and preparedness. He doesn't believe that anyone in Washington is currently interested in de-escalating the situation. On the contrary, he observes a lack of voices advocating for caution or careful consideration of the consequences. There's an absence of serious attention given to intelligence reports regarding potential attacks, both against the United States and its allies. He anticipates an enraged American and European population as they become involved in the conflict, particularly due to their support for Israel. He recounts the case of a Ukrainian official who was assassinated purportedly for being perceived as a Russian collaborator. Despite doubts about his guilt, his assassination reflects the dangerous climate in Ukraine. Another instance involves a defense ministry employee who resigned and expressed doubts about Ukraine's chances of winning the war against Russia. However, he was subsequently blocked from further communication. He believes that the mood in Washington has shifted towards prolonging the conflict rather than seeking a resolution. There's an attempt to pressure European nations, particularly Germany, into actions that could be interpreted as acts of war against Russia, raising concerns about their involvement as co-belligerents. There's no doubt that we are co-belligerents, but it seems that the Germans are now inclined to slow down their involvement. Scholz's recent remarks at the Conference for Donors and Allies indicated a reluctance to send tanks to Russia unless resaken by us. Comments from Department of Defense officials highlighted concerns about the M1 tank's fuel consumption production and maintenance issues, favoring the Leopard tank for its simplicity. While there's agreement on the tank issue, it's not for the reason stated by Mr. Call. The turbine engines in the M1 tank have been problematic for years due to their design for high-altitude use, causing issues with ground operation. Despite historical exaggerations of Russian losses and Ukrainian successes, the truth about the conflict is becoming apparent. The Europeans are realizing the danger of further escalation and lack the industrial capacity to rapidly to produce military equipment. The lead time for producing crucial weaponry-like missiles is significant, posing a challenge in providing immediate support to Ukraine. The Russians, on the other hand, have the capacity to sustain a prolonged conflict unlike the Europeans and Americans. These discussions among European officials underscore the gravity of the situation and the limitations of our military capabilities in a major war scenario. Moreover, there are concerns about historical parallels with FDR's actions in the 1930s, which potentially instigated the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. And we were all aware, contrary to common belief, that the Japanese could indeed launch an attack on and devastate Pearl Harbor. In the lead-up to the war, FDR took several actions. He issued the McCullum Memorandum instructing the Navy to intentionally breach Japanese territorial waters with warships repeatedly, despite the risks of losing ships, stating that a few losses were acceptable. This decision, considered incomprehensible today, ultimately led to the deliberate positioning of the fleet in Pearl Harbor in June 1941, rather than its usual locations on the West Coast. Despite warnings from the Chief of Naval Operations, CNO, about the vulnerability of the fleet, FDR insisted on this course of action. Subsequently, he diverted bombers to China, aiming to bolster their air force to conduct firebombing raids on Japan from there. These actions, undertaken between 1939 and 1941, are often overlooked in historical discussions. Some analysts draw parallels between these actions and the current situation, although it's unclear if President Biden is directly involved in such strategic decisions. The impending Ukrainian collapse in the face of the ongoing onslaught raises difficult questions about future actions. Should we consider deploying Polish, American, Romanian, or other forces to push into western Ukraine or escalate confrontation? The term hybrid war coined by former Marine Major Frank Hoffman describes conflicts involving ground troops, media manipulation.